Welcome to the SEI podcast series, a production of the Carnegie Mellon University Software Engineering Institute. The SEI is a federally funded research and development center sponsored by the U.S. Department of Defense and operated by Carnegie Mellon University. A transcript of today's podcast is posted on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts. My name is Summer Craze Fowler, and I am the Technical Director of Cybersecurity Risk and Resilience in the SEI's CERT division. This is the latest installment in our series of podcasts highlighting the work of women in software and cybersecurity. Today, I am pleased to sit down with Dr. Lori Craner, who does so many amazing things at Carnegie Mellon University and throughout Pittsburgh. Dr. Craner is a professor of computer science and of engineering and public policy at Carnegie Mellon University, where she is director of the Scilab Usable Privacy and Security Laboratory, also called CUPS. She is also associate department head of the engineering and public policy department and co-director of the MSIT Privacy Engineering Master's Program. In 2016, she served as chief technologist at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission in Washington, D.C. And Dr. Craner is also a co-founder of Wombat Security Technologies, Inc., a security awareness training company. Whew. Welcome, Dr. Craner. Thank you. Okay, we listed a, a number of impressive titles, but I want to dig a little deeper here. Uh, tell us about your work in privacy and security and, and public policy. What do you do every day? So my focus is on the human side of security and privacy. And I do research in this area, and I teach and uh, advise students at Carnegie Mellon uh, in this area. And a couple of years ago, I actually took a year off from CMU yeah. and spent a year in Washington, D.C. at the Federal Trade Commission um, as the chief technologist. That's great. Can you tell us a little bit more about that opportunity and what you were able to bring back to the university from that? Yeah, it was an amazing opportunity. I was working directly for the chairwoman of the FTC and so got a lot of insights into how the policy making actually happens. Wow. I was also on some intergovernmental agency working groups, um, so I got some insights into other agencies. Um, and in particular, uh, since uh, privacy is, um, is my main area of interest, um, I got to see kind of what the FTC can and cannot do with respect to privacy, given the current current um, uh, framework that Congress has given them. Oh, that's fantastic. So sometimes when I go home at the end of the day, I struggle to explain to my family what I do on a <laughs> daily basis. Uh, but can you, can you tell folks who are listening, what does a typical day look like for you now that you're back at the university? Oh, um, well, my, my kids think all I do is answer email all day, but <laughs> which is close. Uh, no, I, um, I, I spend some time preparing for classes. Uh, I teach. Um, I have meetings with students. Um, but my, my favorite thing is the research project meetings. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm a number of um, large collaborative research projects with a, a bunch of faculty and students. And um, we're, we're focusing on, on the human side of security and privacy. And so um, I love discussing the, the studies that we're trying to figure out how to do. So, you know, we, we may be looking at, you know, how people use password managers or how people um, read privacy policies. And uh, we spend a lot of time on the details of, you know, if we tell people we're interested in security, like they're, they're going to try to behave like good little security citizens, yeah, right? right? And we need to figure out how to do the study in a way that they're not biased and they're not mm -hmm. going to just tell us what, what they think we want to hear. And um, so I really enjoy those sessions of trying to figure out how to do Bringing this. reality yeah. to, to cybersecurity. Yeah. So you mentioned your kids. I want to go back to your childhood. Yeah. I know that you play soccer with a group of women here in Pittsburgh. I do, yeah. When you were a kid, were you playing soccer? Were you doing math problems in your head? <laughs> uh, what is it that got you on this path into cybersecurity and privacy? Uh, yeah, so I, I was not playing soccer. I tried it once as a kid and hated it. Um, <laughs> and so it took me a long time to come back to that. Yeah. Um, I was doing a lot of math problems. Um, when I was in elementary school, my school got a computer. 
It was a Commodore oh. PET. And none of the teachers knew how to use it. Um, and my dad um, was a biomedical engineer, and he knew how to use computers. Wow. So he, he showed me how to use it. And um, yeah, like during my lunch periods, I, I would go to the office where the computer was and like, um, figure out what to do with it. <laughs> that's, that's pretty neat. Yeah. My, my first computer was also a Commodore 64. The most exciting thing I could do with it was change the color of the font. <laughs> I'll never forget that was. Th this one did not have color, so I could not wow. even do that. Oh, wow. <laughs> So, so as you, you had your dad as someone who helped you um, along the way, but did you have any other mentors who kind of helped shape the path for, yeah. for where you are? Yeah, so my dad, also my mom. My mom um, uh, recently retired as a math professor and a college administrator. Wow. Um, so great, great role models there. Um, but I think I've had role models, you know, throughout my career um, in graduate school. My, my PhD advisor was, was a tremendous mentor to me. Um, and then I think... At each place where I've worked, there have been colleagues who have become mentors to me. Absolutely. So now you've kind of shifted, I'm sure, in where you're not the mentee all the time, but you are mentoring other people. So what have you taken away from those mentors that you emulate and when you mentor students today? Yeah, I think um, a big thing is, is to really listen to them and, and to hear what, where they're coming from and, and what their concerns are. Um, and then trying to both be supportive, but also giving them the bad news. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Trying, trying to tell them the things they don't necessarily want to hear but need to hear, but also trying to be very supportive of, of what they want to do. So those are the roadblocks for them. Uh, what roadblocks did you maybe stumble into when someone gave you the news that you didn't want to hear? And how did you overcome those? Yeah, so I had lots of roadblocks. Um, and uh, so one thing I think it's important that, that people assume that I had a plan about my career. And I can tell you I never had a plan about my career um, growing up or, like, ever. Um, <laughs> so I, I never planned things out. I, um, I, I always kind of look to the next opportunity. Um, and um, the, the good thing about that is that you know, most of the roadblocks were that I was trying for the next opportunity and I didn't get it. You know, something got right. shut down. And, um, but, but I was then open to something else. I, right. I, I, had, I didn't have my heart set on this for the past 10 years, right? So right. Um, I, whenever the, a door has closed, um, yeah, I've been disappointed, but I've also taken that as an opportunity to step back and say, well, I'm going to make myself open to other things. Yeah. And every time that's happened, I think something that I totally didn't expect has come along and has been great. Yeah. And that's fantastic advice. And it's really inspiring for kids who may hit a roadblock to not let that be the end yeah. for them. So yeah. that's great. So let's shift focus, shift focus a bit. In 2017, there were approximately 350,000 current cybersecurity openings, according to CyberSeek. Yet, according to an April 2018 NBC News report, only 11% of cybersecurity professionals working today identify as women. Uh, tell us how you would like to see educators or just the community in general address this deficit. Well, I think that there is a whole range of cybersecurity careers. Um, often people focus on cyber like it's just one thing. But yeah. you, know, you and I both work in cybersecurity, and we do completely different right. things. Um, and, and so I think there's a range of, of um, careers. There's a range of the types of educational preparation that you would need, depending on the type of cyber career that you are interested in. And so I think we need to not think of it monolithically, but really think about that range. And then when we encourage young people to go into it, we can find out what their interests are, what their aptitude is, what sort of educational background they bring, and try to help them find the path that's actually going to work for them. Yeah, and, and that's a really great point, because you have done some really cool things with bringing technology into other fields. If you're watching the podcast right now, you can see Dr. Craner's amazing dress, <laughs> the, the, the uh, famous password dress that you have. Um, I want you to tell us about that, and then also tell us a little bit about uh, quilting. Uh, after you tell us about the dress, I want to talk <laughs> about some of the quilting and exhibits that you've had in Pittsburgh. But can you tell us a little about the dress that you're wearing right now? Sure. Um, so the dress uh, is, is a word cloud made from the 500 um, most common passwords from the Rock U data breach. <laughs> Great. And they, they are scaled according to their frequency and color-coded based on themes that I observed. It, well, it's beautiful, even, <laughs> even as fabric, and, and it really makes a statement. 
but you, you have uh, handmade a number of quilts and you had your own quilt exhibit here in Pittsburgh at our Children's Museum. Um, and one of those quilts also featured the most popular passwords and was featured in Science Magazine. Yeah. So what is this intersection between quilting and fashion and cybersecurity and privacy? <laughs> Well, I've always been interested in art, and I, um, I minored in fine arts when I was an undergrad. And then in grad school, I felt like I wasn't making progress on my thesis, and <laughs> I needed to like do something with my hands. And um, I wanted to do oil painting, and I think my husband said that that wasn't a great <laughs> idea in our very small apartment living room. He said, you yeah, know, can't you find something less smelly? Um, <laughs> and it was kind of a whim that I said, well, I've always wanted to quilt, and I bought a quilt wow. book and some fabric, and I started making quilts. And then when I graduated I, and had a job, I bought a sewing machine. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've always liked about quilting is the patterns in it. Yeah. And rather than just following the traditional patterns, I like to create my own patterns. Uh, and I use um, I use computing tools to do that. Um, wow. Largely, I use PowerPoint. It's a, it's a complete abuse of PowerPoint, but but it works. <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> but but I've I've also um, done some other things, and and so I. Um, a few years ago on my sabbatical, I actually spent a year in the art school at Carnegie Mellon making wow. quilts, um, which, like, how cool is that? So uh, do you have algorithms hidden in your quilts? I do. Well, so, so <laughs> there, yeah, definitely. I, I, I could go on for an hour about that. But, like, I have one quilt that I want it to look sort of randomish, but in a controlled way. And so basically I have an algorithm that I use for placing the colors in the quilt. Um, so wow. it is done algorithmically, but it, the effect looks like it was done randomly. Okay. Um, but, but, it, but it ensures that you don't have like two of the same color next to each other and things like right. that. Um, I also, uh, when I, I was on sabbatical, I was working on hand drawing a design for a quilt um, uh, in the art school. And one of the art professors came up to me and he's like, you could write a computer program to do this. This looks like very tedious. And, and I said, I, I'm not a graphics programmer. I, I don't do that. And so he started writing the program for me and then, wow. and then <laughs> sent it to me like half done and said, oh, you're a computer science professor finish it, right? <laughs> I had no idea how to do it, but out of pride, I, I had right. to at that point. Um, um, but it was actually a lot of fun because I had this little tool where I could um, experiment with, oh, what if I change this color? What if I change the proportions? What, wow. right? And I could experiment with that. And then I had, you know, I'd print on the color printer, like all my different variations yeah. and then pick the one that I was actually going to make in fabric. That's, a, that's really awesome. So. And it's fun because it is bringing art and technology together and and it's a great part about being at an interdisciplinary place like Carnegie Mellon, yeah. so yeah. That, that's fantastic. Yeah. So next year, you're keynoting at the 2019 Women in Cybersecurity Conference that's being held here in Pittsburgh in late March. Uh, CMU is one of the co-sponsors of the conference. Can you tell us a little more about this conference and why events like this are important to you? Yeah, so this is a conference that brings together uh, women um, who are interested in cybersecurity. Uh, there's a lot of students there. Um, I, I don't know the numbers, but but I, I went a few years ago, and there, yeah. it seemed like every other person there was a student. Um, and uh, and they bring in uh, speakers who are really inspiring for the students to to see. Uh, I think there are a bunch of employers who are talking about you know career options and collecting resumes, um, and their workshops shops um, on, on various uh, technical issues as well as career yeah. issues. And so it's, it's really a great opportunity to, for, well, for these um, uh, uh, women, both students and, um, and, and junior people in the field, to see, wow, there, there, there is a critical mass. There are other women here, um, and, yeah. and to learn from them. Um, so yeah, I, th I, th I think it's a great event. And, and so what do you think that you're going to be saying in the keynote, just as a, a small preview, so that people <laughs> want to come back and hear more um, yeah so so uh, I asked them you know should I talk about my career or should I talk about you know the research that I do and they said yes uh, <laughs> so um, I I will have uh, a, a story about basically the things that I, I did throughout my career and and some of the research but also tying in some of the kind of life lessons that I learned along the way that's that's fantastic. You've accomplished so much already, and I know you said you don't have like a clear roadmap that, you, that you're following, but what are some of the next goals that you have uh, when it comes to your professional life and, and privacy? 
Well, so I have gotten interested in taking um, kind of more of a leadership role in in things, and I actually completed at the um, at the Tupper School of Business at CMU. They have um, a leadership academy for women. Uh, I'm uh, a graduate. Oh, okay, great. So <laughs> I did it last year. I love that program. Yeah, um, and uh, so that that was was actually like pretty inspiring. Um, and so uh, I I've been trying to get in, involved in a, in more of a leadership role on campus, um, and so. I, I hope to be doing more of that. That's awesome. It, it sounds like you're a lifelong learner <laughs> and that you, uh, you like to, to, to learn more all the time, but we're in an age of information overload. So where do you go to get the best information? What books do you read? What articles? What podcasts do you listen to? Yeah, uh, definitely. There's information overload, and um, and so um, I, I wish I could say that I was more like systematic about it, but it, it, it is very haphazard, and and often <laughs> it's whatever has landed in my email or a student has you know handed me or whatever is, is what I read. Um, I I do get a few daily newsletters. Um, so the International Association of Privacy Professionals mm-hmm. (IAPP) has a daily dashboard of privacy news and. I, I do try to read that almost every day um, and then dig down on the articles of most interest. Um, uh, Politico uh, has a, a morning yeah. newsletter on, um, on, on, I guess it's cybersecurity, uh, and I do uh, read that as well. Um, and, uh, but a lot of it is just stuff that I see on my Facebook feed from my friends or things people hand me or send me. Great, great. So if you could give one piece of advice to a young person who's listening right now, who's considering entering this field, uh, what would that be? Um, I, I would say that this this is a great field and that um, you know, there, there are obstacles, there are roadblocks, but you can overcome them. Don't, don't let something that somebody said to you or looking around the room and seeing that there aren't very many other women hold you back. Uh, you know, you got this. That, that's great. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Craner. You're welcome. This podcast is available on the SEI website at sei.cmu.edu slash podcasts and on Carnegie Mellon University's iTunes site and the SEI's YouTube channel. As always, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email us at info at sei.cmu.edu. Thank you.